we got so many people who would come to an event with some sort of distance in mind, but the wind would be blowing in the right direction on the day. They were having a great time. And because it's a lap format, you're never that far away from the aid station. So I think people felt a lot more comfortable. And we found so many people would come along and say, right, I'm going to do a 5K or a 10K. And they'd run a half marathon. And more often than not, it would be their very first half marathon. And then we started to get people running, I guess, what we call accidental marathons, which if you said that to a lot of people, they'd be like, well, that's clearly crazy and that can't possibly happen. But actually, we get a lot of people who've never run further than a half marathon. Almost every event, we probably get somebody who didn't plan a marathon who runs one. Hello and welcome to a slightly late Running Tales podcast with me, Craig Lewis. They do say that the best things come to those who wait and we've got a really special conversation this week with Rick Verco. Rick, along with wife Louise, is one half of the team behind the hugely popular Phoenix Running. I chatted to Rick about how Phoenix led the way in introducing lapped events and encouraging runners of all abilities to achieve goals they often never set out to do, as well as how Phoenix has responded to the post-pandemic challenges that have faced many race organisers. But I couldn't chat with Rick without mentioning his own incredible running journey. Here's just a few highlights of what he's achieved. He's a member of the 100 Marathon Club with a few more than that along the way as well. He uh, was the fastest cowboy at the London Marathon. He completed 152 marathons and ultras in a year. And his races include things like the North Pole Marathon and the Marathon de Saab. There's a lot more to what Rick had to say as well, and I really hope you enjoy this week's podcast. We started off by having a chat about Phoenix Running. Well, Phoenix Running was definitely born out of my own running. So I guess it's probably sort of fair to say that when my sort of own fairly short sort of running career started, when I started to slow down and to do less running myself, I really wanted to, I guess, take what I'd learned from being around on the running circuit for a while. And certainly having gone to lots and lots of marathon events myself, I'd seen lots of different race organisations putting on events in lots of different ways. And I thought to myself, actually, I think there's a few tweaks and um, particularly around the inclusiveness, something that perhaps I could learn from all of that and apply. And so back in, I think it was 2014, so it's nearly 10 years ago now, we put on our very first event. And funnily enough, I was talking to somebody about this just the other day, and it was write a check for entry. So I remember getting a whole bunch of checks through the actual postal service. And so it was all done manually, that very first race. And we put on a marathon and a half marathon. So there were two events that went on sort of concurrently. And yeah, we did, and it all just went from there, really. So it really was born from me thinking, actually, I think I could could hopefully improve on some of the things that I'd seen out there and go from there. And practically, what were those improvements? Well, I think particularly around inclusiveness. So one of the things I noticed out on the circuit, and I guess in fairness, some of that was being driven by the fact that I was running a lot of marathons myself. And so I guess by their very nature, you know, 26.2 miles is a long way. And that's not necessarily a format that attracts everybody. And I guess it doesn't generally attract people that are very new to running. And I'd seen a format in the States and I'd seen a format being done in this country, which was around what we called a timed event format. Some people call it a challenge event format. And that's where rather than have a point to point or a large single loop for, say, 26.2 miles, as an example, you have a much shorter distance and you effectively run laps. And I'd done a few similar events myself and really liked the format. For me, I found that I was able to break that 26.2 mile distance down into almost a time trial. So for me personally, when it was all about trying to get around as fast as I possibly could, it meant I could break that down into bite-sized chunks and hopefully improve on my own time. But what I noticed in particular being out there doing that is that I got to see everybody else's race and everybody else got to see my race. And so whilst I would still turn up to events and, and, and try and get around as quick as I could, I saw all of the different abilities of runner that were out there. 
people that were out there doing their very first event and were probably going to do a 5k or something like that, which was an immense achievement because they'd, you know, probably only a month or two earlier, probably been on the couch or they were doing a couch to 5k. So we sort of took that format and said, okay, can we standardize it completely? So we very much went down the route of doing a 3.28 mile lap or a 5.28 kilometer lap. And the reason for that very specific distance is that, of course, if you multiply that by four, you get an exact half marathon. If you multiply it by eight, you get in a marathon. So we worked backwards, broke that down and said, OK, all of our events, bar none, and actually we have got one, I think, that's different now, but all, our, all of our events in the early days were modelled around that specific lap distance. There were some other organisations that did a similar format, that did different length laps. We said, right, it's going to be a standard four for half, eight for marathon, and anything else you want to run from one lap or up, anything else in between. And if you want to run an ultra, then you run nine laps or longer. And we put that format in place, and it was just right from that sort of very first year that we we did that it was just brilliant because we got people that came along who were absolutely coming to their very first event and they looked at it and said well actually i'm just gonna try and get around one lap and they get the same finishers medal as somebody who run, runs 10 laps they get the same support they get the same access to the aid station and all of the sort of bells and whistles that we've added since you get that whether you're running one lap or whether you're running 12 or 13 laps. And what we found right from the get-go is that we got so many people who would come to an event with some sort of distance in mind, but the wind would be blowing in the right direction on the day. They were having a great time. And because it's a lap format, you're never that far away from the aid station. So I think people felt a lot more comfortable and we found so many people would come along and say, right, I'm going to do a 5K or a 10K. And they'd run a half marathon. And more often than not, it would be their very first half marathon. And then we started to get people running, I guess, what we call accidental marathons, which if you said that to a lot of people, they'd be like, well, that's clearly crazy and that can't possibly happen. But actually, we get a lot of people who've never run further than a half marathon. Almost every event, we probably get somebody who didn't plan a marathon who runs one. And they come along and they do four laps and they're like, actually, wow, do you know what? I'm I'm either feeling great or I'm having a good time. I sort of don't want it to finish. So we said, we'll just go out and have, you know, do another lap, do do 16.4 miles or 19.9 miles. or And people will do six laps and then they do seven laps. And once they've done seven laps, we say to people, well, nobody stops at seven. And we try and sort of nudge them onward. And yeah, we get people that come and do a lot of accidental marathons and just can't believe what they've achieved. So, you know, I love the format from that perspective because it is really, really inclusive. And there really isn't a, a, a sort of back marker. You know, if you're running from A to B, somebody is absolutely always at the back. But with the, the lapped and the looped format, half the time you're never really sure who's, who's at the front or who's at the back, unless you're really specifically keeping tabs as you're out there running. And so you just see everybody's race unfold and everybody's run unfold and people come and then people sort of start to finish. And then, you know, yes, we have a back marker. And we, we always say we get somebody who gets the most value for money on the day rather than somebody who takes the longest amount of time. And, um, and it's, just, it's just been a brilliant format ever since that sort of very first year we did it. Yeah, and, and I, I've done a, a few of these with, with with various events, and like you say, with the back marker, you really don't have one because you can have somebody who sets out to do their ten k, does their ten k, and they they actually finish four hours ahead of the person who does an ultra. So yeah. although they might be a lot slower, they finish a lot earlier. So there's not that sort of natural hierarchy of the person who's much slower, for want of a better word, coming in hours after the person who is the fastest it doesn't exist in those races but i'm interested in how quickly that took on because it's it's i think it's a uh, a natural concept these days there's lots of those kind of races around but i'm guessing 10 years ago it, it didn't really exist at all no i mean i mean when we very first i think the first event we put on in that format was 2015 and when we did there were there were two race organizers doing it and actually it was like that for quite a while and i think a lot of other organizations sort of saw that format and saw people enjoying that format and as 
you know, as happens in this world, you know, other people then thought, well, actually, that's a that's a really good format. And so it did, I think, probably around sort of 2017, 2018, it, we started to see more people sort of coming to the party, which is brilliant because it's such an inclusive format. And I think what's quite interesting about it, though, is it, it is still a little bit niche. So whilst lots of organisations are now doing it, I do still think that from a mainstream perspective, the wider sort of audience of runners, if you like, and, uh, because it's quite, a di- it's quite a difficult thing to communicate, for example, on paper or on a, on a race entry system. So people look at it and go, oh, six hour timed event, seven hour timed event. I couldn't possibly run for seven hours. And so they maybe sort of brush on by. So you need to be able to explain that actually it's a lapped format. And you can run any distance from one lap and up, and the lap length is about 5k. But I still don't think that it's it's probably as mainstream as it as it could and should be, just because it is quite tricky to sort of communicate it. And so people who are looking through and are looking for their first 5k, 10k might not find that format. Yeah, and, and I think there is a whether it's true or not, there is a sort of fear of laps among some runners and the potential sort of monotony of laps or oh, I don't want to be yeah. running around the same thing again and again and again but a lot of these courses are actually pretty picturesque they're happening country parks or so on they're not normally um pounding this the streets where it might be a bit more boring I suppose yeah and you know what it's it, it, it it's interesting hearing you say that because there absolutely has been a transition and certainly in the early years of this format for us the first two or three years there was definitely a little bit of prejudice against lapped events definitely and it it was you know we tended to see I think a little bit more old school some of the older school runners more traditional you know a half marathon is a half marathon and you run from A to B and particularly a marathon is a marathon and you run from you know you run from A to B Um, and actually a lot of those events are simply a one lap event so technically unless you're going point to point they are still a lap but i you know i guess that's me being a bit pedantic but but what's quite interesting is i think particularly about maybe three or four years ago probably maybe the a year or so before covid which of course interrupted lots of things but i think probably around that time there was much more of an acceptance for it so we sort of saw a little bit of prejudice, a, a, a few people out there being quite vocal about the fact that all, almost saying, you know, that these are not kind of real runs, not real races. And then I think because they proved to be so popular and so many people came to them and they were so inclusive. And in particular, actually, one of the other areas in, of inclusiveness we see at these events are the uh, the women to men's ratio. So a lot of more traditional events, I think, are still a little bit, sort of men heavy at the start line and the finish line yeah. and our time format, format events just aren't and I think it's for those very same reasons we've touched on already the inclusiveness the fact there isn't a back marker the fact that you feel safe because you're not that far from the aid station and you're seeing the same runners and you're getting the same level of support every time you come through the start finish area so we see a really really even balance of women to men at our races and in fact particularly more recently a lot of our events we actually have something like a six you know we see 60 65 even 70 percent of the field are, are women which is which is just a, which is just brilliant i think from an inclusive perspective so so the whole sort of lapped the lapped format i think is much much more acceptable but i i definitely agree with you there is there was a very definitive sort of acceptance of it probably about four or five years ago and now it feels much more much more normal and actually i i can't remember now the last time i sort of heard somebody really be critical of the kind of lap format it's kind of moved on now which is great yeah i I, I mean i love them i did one uh recently and it is actually that feeling of being able to get back have a little bit of an aid station on your way around rather than just grabbing some water as you're desperately running along yeah. the marathon thing. And you think, well, oh, do you know what? I can just do, I, I might not be able to do the extra between 15 miles, say, and a, a a marathon, but I could do one more loop up to 18. So I'm going to do that. And then you get to the end of that and maybe you can do another one. So it definitely works to to, to keep you going along like that. You, yeah. you mentioned the, the 
dreaded C word a, a little while ago, COVID. Um, I've heard, and I think it's fairly common to, to, that people talk about the impact that's happened since COVID on running events and even down to park run and things like that, that people just perhaps haven't come back and to running groups as well in the numbers that they uh, they came before. Have you found that at all or is that something you've escaped? Yeah, no, we have found that. We've absolutely found that. I mean, we have a, we're very lucky that we have a really loyal core base of runners, most of whom have, have sort of stuck with us throughout. We were able to transition during COVID really quickly to virtual formats. So in actual fact, we sort of replaced all of our all of our attended events. I guess there, there weren't any attended, attended events clearly during those lockdowns, but we were able to replace those really quickly with virtual versions. And because we have a really good and loyal following in our Facebook channels and in our Facebook communities and our social media communities, we were able to use those facilities really well to, I guess, keep people motivated and keep people just going out of the door, putting their trainers on. And at one point, you know, that was, we were encouraging people to do their daily exercise with us. And when you could go out once a day officially and, you know, so go out and go for a run and we'd all sort of get together on the, on the, within the chat groups and, you know, eat virtual cake and go for virtual runs and, and do all of that, that kind of stuff. But, Absolutely. I mean, in 2019, in the sort of run up to early 2020, I mean, we were absolutely flying along. And I think most race organisations at the time were and were still seeing their numbers going up and running was continuing to boom. And then I think COVID clearly came along and, and stuck the brakes on just about everything. And since then, we've we are probably now somewhere around the sort of maybe 70, 75% of perhaps where we were directly before COVID. But what we've seen since COVID over the last couple of three years is a really kind of sort of spike, is a real spikiness. So there's some general behaviour that I know is absolutely being seen across the board by every single race organisation. And though that's things like the entry behaviour. So... We, before COVID, some of our most popular races would sell out in, in, in literally four to ten minutes. We could launch a race and it would be sold out. And that would be perhaps nine months or a year in advance. We virtually never see that now because the behaviour is that everybody books last minute. And because everybody is booking last minute, then that's just the way it is. And so we've seen a lot of our races on and off probably over the last 18 months where you know, you can get to a month out and you're looking at your race numbers and thinking, you know, oh my God, we've only got, you know, like 30% of, of, of the race numbers that we had before. We've only got 30% of the race numbers that we really need to be able to host the event. And then what happens is in the last sort of couple of weeks before the event, all of a sudden you'll get another 60% of entries. And we, we saw that a couple of times. There was one particular event last year we had, I think, with 200 entries. And we got 60% of those entries in the eight in, in the eight to 10 days before the event, which for us, it's not the end of the world. We still need to plan. We still need to have the right number of medals and we still need to have all the right number of marshals and supplies, et cetera, in place. But I, I really feel, I think, for some of those much larger events where, you know, you get two months out and you've got 20% of the entries that you need you simply can't take a risk on spending ten thousand pounds on road closures for example mm. so i can totally understand why lots of events were and still are from time to time cancelling you know we, we saw a lot of last minute cancellations and and people were we you know were, were getting really upset by it but i i really sort of feel for those race organizations from a race director's perspective because it you know, last minute booking does make it really, really hard. And, and and half the time we're taking a punt on what we think will happen from what we've learned from behaviour over the last sort of couple of years. So, so there's definitely been some behavioural changes in terms of what we're seeing our runners doing. And I think as well, you know, it's it, there are more people now. I think there are more race organisations now post-COVID than there were pre-COVID. So actually, you've got this natural economic supply and demand, which whether COVID has happened or not, if you could sort of almost take it out of the picture now, almost like it didn't happen. I'm not overly convinced we'd be in a significantly different 
position as race organisations now, and I know it's easy to say like two, three years after the event, but I'm not convinced we would be because I think a lot more race organisations came to the party around 2018, 2019. A lot of those race organisations completely paused or stopped or, or didn't even kind of go live during COVID. And so there's just more competition now. It's mm-hmm. as simple as that. And if you look at the simplicity of supply and demand, I think there are a, potentially a few less runners now, but I'm not convinced the market is hugely smaller than it was pre-COVID. I just think there's a lot more choice. People are entering a lot of races last minute, which does make it difficult to plan. And so you've just got to try and be a bit more competitive these days. You know, you've got to try and try and attract people to your events. And, and, and there are more events every weekend now than there probably ever were before. Yeah, it's really interesting, actually, because I've been trying to wrap my head around why an event like COVID would result in less people running and entering events now. And it doesn't completely seem to make sense to me because actually during COVID, a lot of us ended up being fitter and healthier than we were before because we, the only time we ever got to go out was to go for a walk or a hike or a run or whatever. And lots of people actually got into running over, yeah. over that period during the lockdown because that's literally all we could do. We couldn't go to the cinema or a restaurant or the pub. Um, so, it, you know, even people who hated running were starting doing it. So I, I actually wonder whether it's more down to the uh, economic situation, some of which was caused by COVID that, we, that we're in now rather than COVID, and, but people put two and two together and don't necessarily get the right answer. Yeah, I, I, I mean, I do, I do think I do think that. And I think what was quite interesting, I mean, I, I talked to a lot of fellow race directors and, and a lot of people in the industry who are involved perhaps in entry platforms and those kinds of things. And there was definitely this sort of almost expected tidal wave of new runners just after COVID. So particularly after the third lockdown and when we had our four stage exit from from that lockdown, all of those people who had discovered running and virtual running and running for their mental well-being and their mental health as well as physical health during COVID, there was this expectation that all of these people were going to enter events and it just didn't happen. And and certainly at the time, I was probably just as surprised as, as everybody else because we were seeing, you know, thousands of people were doing our virtual events during COVID. I mean, literally thousands and thousands. So we had um, more entries for virtual events by far in a year than we ever would have done for attended events. And so there was definitely this expectation that we were going to see all of these new people come to running, as well as, of course, all the old people that used to run come back. And it just didn't happen. And and the virtual has definitely completely dropped off. I mean, certainly from my perspective anyway, I can't talk for anybody else, but the, the number of events we were doing during COVID and, and probably in the, the six to nine months afterwards have dropped back down again. And I always expected that to happen because clearly we wanted all those people to come back to attended events. But this this sort of influx of new runners definitely hasn't happened across the board. And I think now, you know, there were people that, that, that didn't come back to running after COVID, yes. But now I think that that pool of runners that doesn't include a massive influx of new people is now spread, as as, as I mentioned earlier. And so that's, that's probably the reason that most organisations that have been around for any length of time are seeing similar sorts of numbers in, in as much as, you know, 60, 65, 70, 75% of perhaps where they were pre-COVID. I want to move on uh, a little bit from Phoenix Running onto your own sort of running career. You sure. you hinted at having run a few marathons. <laughs> that, I think, is probably um, one of the biggest under-exaggerations I've ever heard because it was a fair more few that, a fair more than just a few marathons, wasn't it? Yeah, so my marathon tally is 323. So from my very first marathon was in 2004. And the last time I ran a marathon was 2016. So yes, 323 across that time frame. And most of those, I have to say, were bunched up into the sort of 2011, 12, 13 and early 14 so a lot of those were done across a a sort of three to four year period and i think if i'm right 152 marathons and ultras in in one year what what brought that on that's right well insanity really but we (laughs) 
So across those sort of three key years, I guess, that I mentioned. So 2011, I think I did my first 52 and 52. So I did 54 marathons that year. The following year, 2012, was 56. And then the year that you mentioned, my my big year, as I reference it, was 2013. And in a rolling year, I think, from a few days into January to the same date the following year was, yeah, 100, 152 marathons across that annual period. And I think what, what makes it that quite special, and I think still a record, is that they were all official marathons because lots of people have run – more marathons in a year going out on their own and obviously that's amazing as well but but to to actually do it in official marathons the logistics of that must have been incredible yeah it was i mean it was it was an absolute crazy year certainly 2013 it's it's definitely no longer a record people have certainly superseded it since then but at the time it was both a british and had i been able to apply officially for it would have been a world record but actually that record was beaten during the same year by a chap over in the States who I think submitted his details in the October. So he he took that record officially. But yes, I mean, logistically, I mean, I've got lots of really special and really quite horrendous memories from that year. <laughs> and, you know, there are some sort of, there's some crazy times where it just felt like, I was going from sort of race to race to race. I mean, it was, I guess it was averaging about three or four marathons a week. Um, There were a few 10 marathons in 10 days events that I did in there to get the numbers up. And all of the events that I did from January right through until late November were all also done in the UK. So I, I did go over to Ireland and do a 10 in 10 in the summer that year, but I didn't actually kind of leave our sunny shores until right at the end of November when I flew over to Long Beach to do a 16 and 15 series over there which was when I managed to set the world record for the fastest 10 marathons in 10 days so that was a sort of the icing on the cake I guess if you like at the end of that really big year of running. So I mean the the I guess the most obvious question is just a quite a, a small simple one and that's why well <laughs> I mean interesting question I mean I think I the the volume of marathons progressed from 2010 2011 sort of naturally if you can use the word word naturally about any of that and you know it all started out I guess as it does probably for most people that I met out on the on the marathon circuit, which is, just, you know, you start by running one or two. And then, then you sort of think to yourself, well, I wonder if I could run one this weekend and one next weekend. And then you, you do, and then perhaps it becomes, well, okay, could I do one on Saturday and one on Sunday? And then you do. And then certainly during my big year, I progressed to doing, sometimes I would run one on a Saturday morning. And then I would, you know, I remember doing, I think it was the white star running giant's head, uh, which is really brutal course it was the first one they'd ever done that would have been in 2013 and I ran that down in Sidling in Dorset in the morning ran around that in right around four hours and I think came in in something like fourth place got straight into my car and drove all the way to uh, to Wales and got to Wales something like 15 minutes before Claire Smith was doing the race briefing for the Brutal Midnight Marathon, ran up some god-awful mountain and got down just before it was getting dark at sort of 10 o'clock, got my head down in a in a nearby hostel I booked for the night and then got up at the crack of dawn and drove over to somewhere like Coventry and ran another event over there. And I had a few weekends like that where I was going from sort of, you know, doing some quite big mileage in between. And actually the... Throughout that whole year, in a lot of ways, the running was the easier bit. I mean, it wasn't, but it sort of was because when you're out running, you're just putting one foot in front of the other and just thinking about whatever's going through your head and getting to the finish line. But when you've got to worry about the logistics and and getting from A to B and getting there in, a, in, in the right amount of time, it does become, you know, it becomes a logistical nightmare. And that was by far the biggest challenge during that whole year was, was getting from A to B rather than actually doing the running bit when I was there. 
Yeah, I've actually heard um, Steve Edwards, who I'm, I'm sure you'll probably know, say exactly. He's, the same he's thing. a very good friend of mine, Steve. Yeah. yeah, very good friend of mine. Yeah, and he said the same thing. And he said, particularly when he when he started doing his challenges, you'll know he's he's um, getting close to a thousand marathons now, which is, is. absolutely under, unbelievable. He said, actually, now because of events like uh, the 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 loops things and so on that happened with with phoenix it's become a little bit easier now but when he started there was there was very few marathons to yeah uh, to, to to get around um i also wanted to mention to you though um some of the other events you've done because it's not just the marathons i think you've also done uh the uh the marathon de Saab and a marathon in the in the north pole as well i did yes i did the so i did the i did the 28th mds i think it was which was in 2013 so that was that was sort of part of my tally although it only counts <laughs> still only counts as one but yes I did MDS in 2013 which is which is a, as I'm sure you will know is the sort of six day jaunt across the Moroccan Sahara desert and you have a couple of a couple of fairly brutal opening days and then they have us which are sort of 20 23 24 miles with a variety of different terrains varying from sort of fairly flat and fast but very very hot parched sort of riverbed type running to small sand dunes to big sand dunes and in fact the MDS has, has not long finished this year just in the last couple of days I think yeah. and then they have a they have a, a double what they call a double day which is a double marathon day which actually is anything between about sort of 84 to sort of 96 kilometers and then they have a marathon specific day and then right at the end if you if you run the long day fast enough you you actually get a day off or you could be one of the people that are finishing during that day and then the final day is a short day where everybody runs together and just enjoys the the end of the event but yeah mts was a i really enjoyed it actually it was a great event i trained really really hard for it i wanted to go there to compete which i which i was really happy that i did and it was one of those experiences where it's very it's really well done you know they know how to get a thousand people in and out of the desert as safely as you can possibly get a thousand people in and out of the desert in really you know inhospitable weather conditions and they do it really really well it's a little bit commercialized a little bit mainstream but it was a real adventure and it's the sort of thing that People often say to me, well, would you do it again? And my immediate answer, certainly having done it, certainly after having done it in 2013, would have been no, simply because I would have had a lot more things on my list that I would want to do. But actually, it's the sort of event that I would potentially like to go back to it, maybe in another sort of 10 years time, you know, when I'm a lot older and 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 there's going to be no chance of me trying to compete against my younger self but just go back to for the experience again and just to enjoy it all but i would absolutely recommend it to anybody who's who's into endurance running you know it's a great event yeah is it the hardest you've done no i it, 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 i it's going to sound a bit cuz i didn't find it massively difficult it, it it was difficult for lots of different reasons particularly it's it's very hard on your feet and it doesn't matter who you are you are gonna you are gonna struggle a little bit with your feet whether that be from sand rubbing blisters so, so I found it tough from that perspective the running part the distances I didn't find that difficult but that was more because I was you know, I was two and a half years into a massive amount of marathon running. So from an endurance perspective, I was I was OK. I was I was well conditioned. So it was more about coping with different terrain, different weather conditions. My feet didn't cope particularly well, but actually, you know, I got away with it. I mean, the soles of my feet didn't fall off and I, I didn't sort of I, I didn't sort of lose any any massive areas of my feet, which I saw some very horrendous injuries out there from a foot perspective so it could have been a lot worse but um but no i don't think it was i didn't find it massively difficult but it it is a great event mm. i've kind of heard that from reading various articles as well because of the it has this aura about it as being really really hard and obviously it is but it's perhaps not as hard as some other events out there which aren't as uh aren't as commercial i suppose as, as, as you yeah. said 
Um, I'm, I'm just noticing, so I'm just noticing that we're slightly running out of time. So I did want to ask you just one last final question to finish off really. And that's what your, what your future running goals are, because you, you mentioned within there that there hasn't been a marathon for a, a little while. Are the, are the marathon trainers completely hung up or are you uh, just putting them on hold? They are not completely hung up, but they are on the peg right next to completely hung up. And I do have one last marathon goal, actually. So I've run I've run London Marathon nine times, and that was my first marathon. So it's where my marathon journey started. So it would always be quite special. So I would like to run London one last time. I would like to give it a decent go. So I've, I've often thought over the last couple of years about trying to have a really – to really go back into training hard for it and do a couple of really hard training blocks and see if I could get back under three for it. However, I've got two fairly young daughters who are six and eight, and we've been up to the finish line a few times and neither of them are particularly into running. But if there was one more thing I could do in marathon running, it would be to run the London Marathon with those two and hold their hands and cross the finish line together with them. And that whole experience, as is always the case with marathon running, is it, it's not so much about crossing the finish line. It would be the whole journey to get there. It would be the fact we'd have to go to training together. We'd have to work hard. It would be really interesting to see what sort of reaction they would have to all of that. It's a test of your mental force. It doesn't matter how many marathons that you have run. There's never there's never an easy one. And every single one is slightly different and tests you in a different way. So to share that whole experience with my two daughters and to cross the line to cross the finish line at London and then hang my marathon shoes up would be my very last marathon goal. Oh what a lovely dream that is and what an amazing way it would be to finish uh, a, a marathon marathon journey um so yeah i wish you all the best luck with that when when it comes down the line hopefully and uh, and rick thank you so much for joining us today on running tales brilliant you're very welcome craig great to chat to you thanks again to rick verco for joining us on this week's running tales podcast i hope you enjoyed our conversation as much as i did if you did please head along to wherever you listen to your podcast and give us a positive review and rating. It makes such a difference when other people try to find a podcast. There's loads of good running podcasts out there, but we just want more people to listen to ours so they can hear the story of fabulous people like Rick. And you can help us by giving us that review or rating. Thanks again for joining us this week on the Running Tales podcast. And we'll be back next week at the proper time of Tuesday. Look forward to seeing you then.